Hi students and welcome to this lecture. Um, this is going to be called Art and Visual Literacy. I always like to um, give a little uh, lecture right at the beginning of each semester for art appreciation where I talk about, you know, obviously uh, what is art, what, what do artists do, and then how is visual literacy, right, literacy being a type of language um, important in our everyday lives. So we'll start by going over some learning objectives that will come up within this lecture. Um, it'll be relatively short, I'm hoping. So we'll differentiate between passive and active seeing. And then we'll also talk about uh, uh, defining different creative processes and describing the roles that artists have within our society um, and how they engage in that process. All right. So the first thing I wanted to cover is passive and active seeing. I know you didn't have a lot of time, and if we were in person, I would have had um, the slide, the last two slides up, um, the whole time you were coming into the class, giving you ample time to take a look. But I know you were able to look at the last two slides while I was talking. Um, so do you recall the images that were up on the board, on the screen, uh, while I was talking the last few minutes? And of course, I'm not with you, so I can't hear your responses. Um, but I wonder, you know, now think about it for a minute. Do you remember anything was, that was on the screen? And if we were in person, you might say, oh, I mean, usually when I teach this in person, students are usually like, oh, I think there was like a pipe, a tree, maybe, um, and, you know, a flag. So those are, you know, those are vague, right? Yes. These are th things that were on the screen. You know, I can go back a little bit. This is what you saw when I was speaking for the first few minutes of class. Um, but I didn't reference them. I didn't talk about them. They were just there, right? So some of you might have actually looked specifically and looked closely while I was talking at the pipe. Maybe some of you can speak French. You know, this is uh, uh, these. This text is in French. In, uh, in the past, I've had students say, "Okay, the tree." More specifically, it had moss on it. Um, it looked kind of old, it didn't look well. Um, and for the flag, people just thought, oh, there was just an image of an American flag, right? Um, so this is a great way to start thinking about active and passive scene. So all of us do this every day, all day, right? Um, so this is just the idea that seeing is an active, uh, seeing is a, um, it is not a given, it is a process, it is something that we do. Um, yes, um, many of us, if, if you can see, um, you uh, look around you, right, and everything that surrounds you right now, you can look around the room that you're in. Um, these things around you are in your visual field, but it does not mean that you're actively looking at them. So this is the difference between passive and active seeing. Many of you might have started while I was talking and kind of um, just have, have seen these in the background, but not have actively looked at them. Um, this is the way that, you know, when we're um, driving around during the day, you know, we see things, but we're not actively like staring at things, right? Um, so you might have vaguely seen these images, but not actually looked closely at them. So the difference between active and passive is passive are things that are in our visual frame that, you know, uh, we can see certainly, but we're not actually looking closely at them and interrogating them in any kind of active fashion. Um, those of you in class who would have noticed the moss, would have noticed the grass, would have noticed, uh, you know, the debilitated nature of this tree, we're taking more of an active seeing approach to looking at that tree. Um, those of you who looked at this pipe and maybe knew that these were letters and that maybe you speak French and see that it says ceci n'est pas une pipe. In French that means this is not a pipe, which I think it is a pipe, right? So we'll get there in a second. Um, so that would have been an active kind of seeing if you were actually looking at this and trying to read it and thinking about why it might say what it says. And then, of course, for the flag, um, uh, kind of a passive way of looking at this flag would have been, like, oh, yeah, it just looks like the American flag, right? But if you were actively looking, you look closely and see that it's a painting of a flag, right? It's not an actual flag. And it looks like there's some kind of uh, texture to it. There's more than just a picture of an American flag that's out on the pole, right? Um, so this is the difference between active and passive seeing. Um, can you think of some ways in your act in your daily life where you are either actively or passively seen throughout the day? And do you notice that this distinction is 
happening or is it just intuitive? Does it just happen without us thinking about it? So we, if we were in class, I'd ask you to speak to uh, others in class about this and then we'd come together and talk as a group. Um, many students in class will say, you know, I'll bring up for an example, uh, when you're walking around on campus, right? Uh, when you, you're seeing everybody passing you, right? You're not actively looking at them. You're not sitting, you know, someone passes you and you're not saying, hello, hello, welcome, first day of class, hello. You know, you're not looking into people's eyes and really noticing them. You're passively seeing people walking by you, right? The same goes, uh, many students bring up uh, when you're driving and the advertisements that you see on your drive to class during the day or work or wherever you're going, uh, you're not actively looking at most advertisements, right? You're actively looking at the road because you're driving, I hope, um, but you know, the advertisements are there to distract you, right? And to sell you something, but mostly you passively, they're in your visual frame, right? But you're not like trying to read them all at all times. You're not actively seeing them because you're trying to focus on something else. So there's a lot of stuff like this that, um, uh, that kind of goes in between active and passive. And you might say that it is intuitive. It just kind of happens. For instance, if you see, if you're driving and you're focusing on driving and you see a stop sign, well, you're actively engaging in your vision of the stop sign, right? So you are looking at it uh, and you, but you don't have to like stare at it and say, stop, right? That means stop, I better put my foot on the brake. Um, these types of things, you know, active and passive seeing can be uh, overlapping in certain ways like this. It's like, uh, for instance, symbols like that that we see every day have become uh, objects that we can passively see but actively respond to at the same time. So I see, you know, in my peripheral vision, uh, I see the stop sign, I know the symbol, and I stop. I don't have to like actively interrogate the stop sign. I know what I need to do. So there's a lot of different ways of thinking about this, but understanding that we do go from active to passive, sometimes without thinking about it, but sometimes and often thinking about it, like this is something that I want to look at right now and think about versus there's all these things around me and I'm just seeing them without really interrogating any of them. Um, so I hope that that's understandable and I hope it makes you think a little bit more about uh, the way that you engage in your uh, surroundings, uh, because we're uh, surrounded all day by all sorts of, of imagery um, that we sometimes don't want to see and sometimes do want to see. And so we can actively and passively decide how we want to view the things around us throughout the day. So this is something that's fun to talk about right away as we begin to approach the vocabulary of art and thinking about how we might interrogate and analyze the things around us. Um, and these are the skills that we're going to use in this class and skills that we can use outside of class as well. These are transferable skills, as they say. So another key term that comes up in the readings um, and obviously at the beginning of class is how, uh, it, how does active and passive seeing overlap with aesthetics? So you've heard the term before, aesthetics refers to our sense of what is beautiful. And of course, this varies across culture and across time. So what I think is beautiful might be different from what you think is beautiful for a variety of reasons. And different cultures might think that different things are beautiful and these things change over time. Western culture does tend to value order, regularly, regularity, proportion, design elements, and of course, um, the material we're going to go over uh, probably in the next few lectures will cover design and think about what design means. Proportion will be part of that. Um, now, these are harm, hallmarks of what we see used in classical art. So when we talk about classical art, typically we're talking about Greek and Roman kind of art forms um, or neoclassical art forms. And this is what we'll talk about, of course, later in the course when we talk more about kind of the, the range of art history. Um, but these things in Western culture tend to be uh, valued as aesthetically pleasing. So um, how do we see this and how do we see it changing over time? Well, for instance, we do have, and we'll talk more about both of these pieces later in the course, but I do like to bring them up right away. This is called Deriferous. It's by Polyclitus. He was a Greek craftsman, a mathematician as well. Uh, he was kind of a Renaissance man, you might say, in 440. This is uh, before the Common Era. So something to mention uh, just quickly for those of you who are new to uh, BCE and CE. 
in terms of uh, talking about an, uh, 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 a timeline. So BCE stands before, before the Common Era. This is before year zero. So you can imagine that this is 440 years before year zero. And today we are existing in common era. Um, so the Madonna with the long neck you see over on the right side, this is from 1535 of the common era. I should have CE there. Usually when you don't see anything, it does mean of the common era. So common era is the era that we, that we live in today, uh, you know, in the um, 2000s, um, 2021, you know, um, you know, this is 2021 years after year zero. Uh, this painting was made about 500 years ago, right, in 1535. And this one was made 1535 years before year zero. And this one, the Polyclitus piece, is 440 years before that. So I hope that makes sense for you. Everything before year zero is going to be counting, you know, uh, backwards in time, and then we count forward when we go to year zero. So basically, this is an ancient piece of art, right? Um, so this is ancient Greece that we're talking about here. Um, so we have a mathematician, Polycletus, who's working with the human body, and he's really important, and we'll talk more about him later, uh, because he's the first uh, artist to really think about mathematics in terms of the human body and human body's proportions um, to make sure that you know, everything is scientific. Uh, because prior to him, um, artists didn't really know how to um, use math to, uh, to make sure that the legs were the right size, the arms were the right size, the head was the right size, all in proportion to one another to make the human body. So he wrote, um, um, an outline basically of how uh, to best um, um, sculpt or draw or paint the human body by using mathematical equations that would make sure that the body was perfectly in proportion. So this is seen as being like the perfect proportions of man um, right over here, right? And we might find this aesthetically pleasing, right? And who doesn't have a six pack like that? Just kidding, no one does. So this is also idealism. This is something we'll talk more about later as well, is the idealized human body seen as perfect. And we'll talk about how artists begin to develop you that later. Um, okay, so this one, the Madonna with Long Neck by Parmigianino, this is an Italian artist working in a period that we call mannerism. Um, so the mannerists, you know, they're working a long time after Polycletus invented his canon, so they understand perfect proportions, uh, but they don't seem to be valuing them, right? They don't seem to be finding those as aesthetically pleasing. Um, this is the Mary, the Madonna, with a Christ child, so that's supposed to be the Christ child. Um, does anyone find these, <laughs> the, the Christ child's body aesthetically pleasing or are you a little put off by it? I think many of us would say, most of my students are always like, what is wrong with that baby? It's giant, long, its arm is huge, its legs are long, its torso is insane, it's a giant baby and it's way too long. Look at uh, the Madonna's long neck. She's like a snake here. Her long fingers, you know, th th these are not uh, proportional to the rest of her body. These people are not valuing the aesthetics of the ancient Greeks who valued perfection in the human body. Instead, by the 1500s in Italy, uh, within the Mannerist style, these artists were interested in elongation, as tied to beauty, and so that's what we see here. So the Christ child is elongated, made to look longer because it was understood that that was beautiful and most beautiful, um, most aesthetically pleasing, same with the fingers and the neck, even though to us we're thinking, what is wrong? These are not, this is not correct, this looks weird, and the baby looks like kind of a, almost like a greenish gray color, um, but these were seen as aesthetically pleasing at the time. So we can see how these aesthetics change over time and with differing cultures. And then, I mean, as we continue to question aesthetics and beauty, we move to, you know, the 1900s, 1930s, um, and we see Picasso. Um, this is totally different, right? Um, Picasso and the modernists found these types of things um, 
this type of representation of the human body, right, this is still representing a female form, as being aesthetically pleasing. Uh, so I don't think the Greeks would have appreciated that. I don't even think the Italians, the Italian mannerists would have necessarily appreciated Picasso's modernist and kind of abstracted representation of the female form. So just to say these things change over and over, and they're still changing all the time because artists and cultures and people value aesthetics differently and question beauty in differing ways. Now let's talk about a few other processes of seeing. So we talked about active versus passive. We're also going to cover what we call trompe l'oeil. Um, trompe l'oeil, you know, this is a French term. Uh, pronounce it as you, as you will. Um, basically it means to fool the eye in, uh, in French. And so both of these artists here are in a way fooling us. Um, Edgar Mueller, this is a German artist, a contemporary street artist working today, who is fooling us into thinking there's a giant hole in the ground. But if you look closely, um, you could go walk onto this. This is sidewalk chalk that is used to paint, basically painting the sidewalk to look like a gaping hole. Um, so he's fooling us into thinking we're seeing something that we're not actually seeing. So that's a uh, trompe l'oeil. Um, and then here with uh, the pipe that you saw at the beginning of class, we see René Magritte. This is a French artist who was working in the 1920s. He thought of himself as a surrealist. Um, so he's representing reality, right? This is a pipe, right? It looks like a pipe. It's supposed to be almost photorealistic painting of a pipe. Yet the artist chooses to write, this is not a pipe underneath. So why would he do that? Well, he's fooling us, right? Um, it looks like a pipe and you wanna say, yeah, it is a pipe, but in fact, it's not. So here he's thinking of uh, the way that we use language to describe things, uh, the way that representations of objects trick us. Um, so it's not a pipe, right? It's actually a painting of a pipe. It's a representation of a pipe. So it is not the actual pipe. So thinking about language and ling linguistics and the way that we say things are what they are when typically they're just a representation of that. So uh, really thinking about tricking us and thinking about language in that process with uh, this work, uh, the treason of images, right? Uh, and it's a whole series of different objects that he painted photorealistically and then called them treasons, right? These are tricking you, they make you think they are the object, but they're really just a painting of the object. Really, it's just paint placed on the canvas by the artist. And then I also, um, and so here's more trompe l'oeil for you. Um, this is actually a, a painting on the outside of a building in the Oregon Hist Historical Society in Portland, Oregon uh, from the 80s. And so it looks like this beautiful painting with, or it looks like this beautiful side of the building uh, with columns and sculptures coming out of the side of the building. Well, it's not, right? If you look closely, these are just paintings of sculptures. And so again, it's tricking us into thinking that this is this grand sculpted side of the building. It's really just painted, again, a trick, a trombone. And uh, Trumlui is not a new thing. Uh, the ancient Romans, uh, people who are living in ancient Rome and Pompeii, you may have heard of Pompeii before if you've heard of Mount Vesuvius erupting uh, in the seven, you know, this is ancient, um, uh, ancient Roman times, 79 of the common era. Uh, basically this volcano erupts unannounced and covers this entire city in, uh, in Rome, uh, it, uh, in Italy, um, and it is, Pompeii is the ancient city, um, covers it completely and basically preserves it for art historians and archeologists later to uncover. And basically it preserved everything because everything was uh, covered in volcanic ash. So now we have these ancient Pompeian uh, frescoes. That means paintings on walls where we see that, you know, in someone's bedroom, you might have this kind of trompe l'oeil painting uh, in which it's, uh, these columns have been painted. Um, this window has been painted looking to the outside, but really it's just a wall. It's tricking uh, people into thinking they have this gorgeous view of outside when it's just a painting, it's two dimensional. Another way that we see Trumboy um, is uh, it's not so specifically like tricking us in this way, but tricking us into thinking uh, uh, um, that we're just seeing a flag, when in fact this is a collage. It's an encaustic collage. That means the artist used wax um, basically to paint over uh, articles uh, from the local newspapers 
from the 1950s. So this is Jasper Johns, an artist who was fascinated with the image of the flag um, and used it multiple times in his work. You'll actually see some of it, um, I think it comes up in the readings for this week as well, one of his other works. Um, and he famously talked about um, this as being uh, the flag. He says, many of us look at the flag, we see it, we look at it, but we don't examine it. So this gets us back to thinking about active versus passive seeing again, right? So what does it mean to really look at the American flag and to know what it means? Um, and here you actually have headlines of important things that were happening in the 1950s that are embedded within the flag. So you really have to look specifically closely at it to really understand the artwork. And he would argue to understand the kind of convoluted and um, intense chaotic history of America and at the flag as a symbol itself. Just to show you more of his works, he's worked with the flag a lot. Um, here he's got three flags stacked. Here he's got a white flag. And we'll actually look at another one of his flags later in the class when we talk about colors and complementary colors. The other way I wanted to think about uh, the way that we see is through the concept of framing. So if we were in the classroom together right now, I'd say, why don't you look out the window? Tell me what you see. Uh, what do you see out there? And you students would say, oh, and here's a window. You know, I look outside and I see an oak tree, my mailbox, um, signs, cars, traffic. You know, if you look here, you'd say, I see a meadow. Uh, there's a road, it's foggy, this and that. Well, when we talk about the things that we're seeing, especially if we're looking out a window, we never talk about the glass, right? The window itself. Um, and this is because we see through it, right? So this is a good way to think about framing, is the way that we view everything around us is always through a frame. And frames can be um, our biases, the way that we were raised, our religion, our culture, our gender, our race, uh, our, um, our class, right? Meaning how much uh, money our parents make, how much money we make, how we kind of work within the system around us. And all of these things actually frame the way that we see the world, right? Because we've been raised with certain values and whether or not we know it, this is the way that we view the world. And so this must be part of how we view art as well. And so this is something that's always important to bring up as we begin this class together, is that each of us will view the world differently, right? I view it differently than you do. And age is part of our frame as well. Um, so if you're a younger person, you're viewing the world differently than an elderly person probably views the world because of your life experiences. So making sure that we come to the class with an open mind, understanding open eyes, understanding that we all see things differently, and to be mindful that we can learn from other people's mode of seeing. Um, just as we can teach other people through our mode of seeing. Does that make sense? I know you can't respond, but... Um, so for instance, with an image like this, so you might look at this and say, wow, okay, let's look at this painting, what's called God Bless America, uh, by an American artist, Faith Ringgold, in the 1960s. And you'd say, I see uh, parts of the flag here. I see part of a star being part of the flag. I see a woman, uh, seems to be an older woman. She looks tired, right? Um, and then if you know more about it, you can see the frame of this artwork is actually in the 1960s. And uh, Faith Ringgold was a black female artist working in the 1960s. And this is during the civil rights movement. So there is a context and historical context that frames this work. And within this work, we also must think about racism within the legal system. So she's using the flag, but framing it in such a way um, that the, the flag becomes type of kind of um, um, uh, prison bars that seem to be imprisoning this uh, African-American figure. And she also uses a flag to kind of, uh, uh, in, makes it in some ways seem as a, uh, a police badge, right? Um, that one might be holding and she's holding it to her heart. And so she's thinking about for her, um, in the context of this, she actually is critiquing the criminal justice system, which in the 60s in the context of civil rights, the civil rights movement, you know, we're jailing a lot of black people for standing up for themselves and for moving against the system, which subjugated them. So there's a lot going on and framing helps us to think about how, you know, how we can put 
uh, art uh, into context uh, within the course. So now let's talk for a little bit about what artists do. There's five things that are going to be covered here. Um, don't worry if you can't remember all of them, but basically they make a visual record of people, places, and events in their time. So this is the most kind of essential. Uh, a lot of key terms here, art can be representational, that means it portrays objects in recognizable form. Art can be realistic, this occurs when images resemble what the eye sees. So that pipe was representational, right? It, um, it showed an object that we recognize. It was also realistic because it looked like that pipe. Um, and then a piece can be photorealistic if it is also supposed to be looking like a photograph. So this image here that you see by Chuck, Chuck Close, uh, this is a self-portrait of him from the 60s. It looks like a photograph, right? What's actually a painting? Here's the, um, uh, um, the picture of the artist himself. He just recently passed away. Um, this is a, a painting. If you look closely, you can see that it is painted. Um, so would you say that it's representational and photorealistic? Yes, um, it is representational. It represents a person. Um, and it's also photorealistic, right? It goes beyond realism because it looks almost like a photo. Now, what do artists do? Artists help us to see the world in new and innovative ways. Uh, here we can talk about Picasso. Uh, we talked earlier about one of his works that was, you know, representing a woman, but representing her in a different way, right? So here we have women at, um, you know, from just the turn of the century where you have artists thinking about modernism, thinking about abstraction, and thinking about using, you know, this is right after photography was invented. We'll have a whole nother lecture on photography where we talk about how important that was. Um, and so this is the artist showing us a new way of uh, looking at the female form, right? Uh, an abstracted way of looking at the female form. And this is uh, Les Demoiselles de Avignon. This Avignon is a French town. And this is a, um, or a French street, I'm sorry, in Paris that was known for um, um, being busy with prostitutes. And so um, this is supposed to be an image of prostitutes on this street. And as you can see, some of these women are almost completely abstracted in the face. And he looked actually was inspired by African masks. He was a huge collector of African masks uh, at the turn of the century um, and let that, in, that inform his uh, modernist thinking about uh, the female form. And we'll talk more about him later in the course as well and why he was so fascinated with masks. But for instances here, uh, you can see that he's really interested in abstraction and thinking about how he can change our way of looking at the female form. Um, artists, you know, here's back to the tree we saw at the beginning of class, they do change the way we see things. So you might have seen this as just a simple tree, um, but uh, artist Ken Gonzalez Day um, uses, this is a series of imageries, uh, it's called At Daylight the Miserable Man was Carried to an Oak, and it's from a series called Searching for California Hang Trees. Um, so when I say hang trees, okay, you might be thinking about this tree differently already. And you might be thinking of it through the mode and through the kind of the context of lynching, right, hanging trees. And so the artist did research, artists often do research when they're thinking about their works, and he documented uh, uh, um, uh, 350 different lynchings that, lynchings that took place in California. We think about lynchings being kind of like a Southern thing. Well, in Southern California, uh, there's a series of 350 lynchings that happened in California between 1850 and uh, 1935 that involved people of Mexican descent. So we think of lynching as being tied to African American history, but really he's making us think more about that and changing not just the way we think about this tree, but also the way that we think about the history of lynching and the history of Mexican Americans. Um, because, you know, these people were also vilified for being different and for um, 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 just in the same way as African Americans were and were lynched on a mass scale as well at this time. And so this really changes the way that we think. So he went to these trees, took photographs of these trees where Mexican Americans were lynched in America at this early period and really giving us a new way of thinking of uh, Mexican-American history and heritage, and also uh, a new way of thinking about lynching in America. Uh, what do artists do? Another thing they do is they, are, they make functional objects and structures, buildings more pleasurable and uh, elevate them uh, to imbue them with kind of a 
more meaning. So architecture is one thing. Um, uh, Frank Lloyd Wright's architecture is another thing. So this is an artist who's interested in nature and the natural world. He famously talked about his architecture as being organic architecture. So you see that this in this uh, a piece of architecture, this house is called Falling Water and it's literally built over a waterfall. So the water goes underneath the house. You can actually see, you know, you can hear water all around the house. It goes into the house. Um, here's some more pictures of this, uh, this house. Um, so uh, there's a stair stairway that goes down to the water and then you see a fountain from the patio. Um, trees, the you know, architecture has been built around trees as you can see this beam that supports part of the architecture has been built with a semicircle around a tree that pre-existed. Um, so this was his way to unite architecture with the earth. Just another thing that artists do. Artists give form to the immaterial, uh, the hidden or universal truths, spiritual forces, and personal feelings. So to think about this, it's important to talk about uh, uh, African spirit spouses. This is from the Baule culture of Africa. These people, this culture is uh, uh, located in the Côte d'Ivoire. Um, this is a French way to say the Ivory Coast, uh, right here in Africa. So the uh, these figures, uh, this figure that you see here would be called a blah, blah, blah. This is a spirit spouse. Um, so this would have been made by a local craftsman um, within the ballet culture for someone who does have a spouse in the real world, a real human. But they, people also had um, these objects that would call, be called a spirit spouse to connect them with their spouse in the spirit world. So it's understood that you had a, a spouse who was your in-person spouse, but you also had one in the spirit, the world of the spirits. Now, these were not meant to re be representational of a specific person. These are not portraits, but rather are, are idealized to look uh, aesthetically pleasing so that the spirit spouse is drawn to the shrine where you have their sculpture. These are pretty small, um, but they're not idols. They're not worshiped. Rather, they are points of contact. Um, so they open lines of communication between our world, you know, the world of reality and the spirit world. Um, the things that are unseen. So these were seen as being attractive and beautiful, aesthetically pleasing to the world of the spirit so that your spirit spouse can come and communicate with you. Um, this is something that we call animism as well. This is the belief in the existence of souls and the belief that non-human things can also be in, in, endowed with a soul or a spirit. So these objects can do that. And you see now, you know, these are still being made today within this culture. Uh, these, you know, now there's people, these are from the 60s, and you can see that they make them aesthetically pleasing. So they look like people from the 60s, like cool high heels, a cool dress, a nice suit, right? All that good stuff. So that's basically all I have for you today. Here's kind of what we went over uh, with the things the artists do. They make a visual record, right? This is the most obvious, um, and they make them in a variety of ways. They help us to see the world in new and innovative ways. They make functional objects, structures, buildings. We looked at the Frank Lloyd Wright house, more pleasurable. And then they give them give form to the immaterial, right? These spirits who need a home. Um, in the ballet culture through the spirit spouse. So that's all we're going to go over today. It's just kind of an introduction um, and I'll be posting more soon. Thanks for listening. Thanks for watching and I uh, hope you have a great week.